Okay, time for a couple more quick exercises. We're going to look at a piece of code and uh, kind of deduce what the compiler step does and what the interpreter, interpreter step does. Uh, this might seem like I'm beating this concept to death, but hopefully this example is going to uncover a couple of things. So this is slightly more complicated than the code that we've been using. And then at the end of this tutorial, I'm going to show you something that might come as a bit of a surprise. So even though you feel fairly confident about scopes and uh, the interpreter uh, logic, I still recommend you work your way through this one. I'm going to show you the code and I'm going to pause for a couple of seconds for you to kind of pause the video and come up with an answer and then we'll see if, uh, you know, if you're right. Okay, so let's start with this simple program, which starts with var a equals 10, which is a global A. And now let me create a function called outer which has a variable b and then it's assigned uh, the value which is a and then I'm going to print console.log of b. Okay, so now inside this outer function, I'm going to create an inner function. Okay, so I have this function called inner and in that inner function, I have a var b equals 20. So I'm re-declaring re the variable b and then I have a var c equals b and then I'm printing console.log of C. And so now I have a function called outer and inside outer I have a function called inner and I'm going to execute the inner immediately after I've defined it. So here is the declaration of inner and then I'm executing immediately. So whenever outer is called, it does some stuff and then it executes the inner function. Okay, so now all I have to do is call outer because if I don't do that, nothing is going to run. So I'm going to call outer so that outer gets called and then inside outer I have a function called inner and then outer calls inner. So inner gets executed as well. Okay, so now it's time for us to play the role of the compiler and the interpreter, uh, draw up a scope chain uh, and see if you can guess what gets printed on the console. Okay, so now let's look at the scope chain here. Now we have uh, the compilation step. Let's run through this quickly. Uh, we have a var a, so there is a global a, and then there is a function outer, so there is a global variable called outer. And now it's going to examine this line, var b. Again, we're looking at the compiler step, so we're just looking at the vars. So var b is going to create a new variable called b in the scope of outer. And then no variables here. Now there is a function inner, so there is a variable called inner created in the scope of outer. All right, and now this line executes. There is a var b inside inner. So there is a new scope called inner and then there is b registered inside the scope of inner. And now there is a var c, which means that there is a variable c registered in the scope of inner. This line, the compiler doesn't care about. This line, the compiler doesn't care about. And this line, the compiler doesn't care about because all these lines do not create new variables. All right, now the compiler is done. Now it's time for the interpreter. We have created a scope chain here, which are which comprises of three scopes, all right? Now let's look at the job of the interpreter. What does it do? We have a first line, A equals 10. The interpreter looks at this part now, and now it allocates 10 to A. Again, the interpreter goes to the global scope and says, hey, global scope, give me A, and the global scope does, and 10 gets assigned to it. Now this is a declaration, so the interpreter doesn't really do anything about it at this point of time. Now it comes to line 14, now it executes outer. So now the interpreter says, hey, global scope, give me a variable called outer. I'm assuming it's a function, so give me that. And the scope does have a variable called outer, which happens to be a function, of course. And now the interpreter executes it. It comes to line four. Now the interpreter looks at this part alone, b equals a. Now it says, hey, outer, give me b. The outer says, yes, I've got it. Now it says, hey, outer, give me a. The outer says, I have no idea what a is. Now the interpreter goes one level up and says, hey, global give me a and the global gives it and now it has the value 10 now the b in the outer scope contains the value 10 and now console.log of b gets called console of course results to global i'm not going to get into that but now b needs to be accessed it's a read operation so again the interpreter says hey outer give me b and then the uh, outer scope contains b which contains 10 so 10 gets printed and now this again the interpreter doesn't care about it at this point of time now it comes to line 11. Now line 11 says execute the function inner. Now inner is again a variable reference. So the interpreter says, hey, the scope of outer, do you have a variable called inner? Now there is. So it gets that variable, which is in the scope of outer, and then it executes it. Now the execution leads to the interpreter coming over here. It says b equals 20. Now the 
execution, the interpreter says, hey, scope of inner, do you have a variable called b? Now inner says, yes, I've got b, and now it allocates the value of 20 to it. Remember that this is different from the b in the outer scope, right? That was a completely different variable. Now it's gonna to come to this line. This part is what the interpreter looks at, c equals b. Now it says, hey, scope of inner, do you have c? The, in the scope of inner gives it c. Scope of inner, do you have b? The scope of inner gives it b. And now console.log of c is going to print the scope of inner c because it says, again, it looks at scope of inner to get that c. And that gets printed. And that's the final result. Hopefully this was instructive. This is one of the um, more complex examples we've seen in this course so far. It actually looks at multiple nested functions. And this is what happens when you have multiple nested functions. You have multiple scopes and then variables get registered in those scopes and there is always a lookup and again if you were to have a variable access of a over here without the var then uh, the interpreter would have gone all the way up to the global end access this one now even though there were multiple scopes in the scope chain it was fairly simple to figure this out at this point of time you would have probably thought hey i don't really need to draw this scope chain in order to figure this out i can actually look at the code and say hey this is what it is and I can figure out what the output is without having to go through the process of being the compiler and being the interpreter. But here's the twist in the tale. Here's where there's a little bit of surprise that I have in store for you. Now, imagine what would happen if I make a couple of minor changes to this code. Now, let's say I, let's say I take this line out and then add it after the console.log. Okay, let's say I remove this line and move it around. Now would you be able to guess what gets printed on the console? In fact, let me ask you this. In this line of the code, line seven, what is the B over here? What variable does this B point to? If you're not careful, what you would probably think is that this B points to the outer scope because at this point of time, there is no var B. Var B in the inner scope happens only over here, right? If this were to be the inner scope, there is var b which happens below, but now here at line seven, there is no var b yet, but we are accessing b. So you would assume that b is actually gonna get delegated to the outer scope, right? It's gonna look up one level up and it's gonna find this, and now it's gonna find the value 10, and now 10 gets assigned to c. Well, there you would be wrong. What gets printed in this line is not 10. What gets printed is undefined. And in order to understand that, you have to draw the scope diagram and play the role of the compiler and interpreter. I know it's not fun, but there are gotchas like this where you really need to step through the process in order to understand it. And again, the reason why this comes as a surprise is because there are two separate steps. There is a compiler step which looks at the wars, and there is an interpreter step which doesn't look at the wars. So the order of the wars is really not affecting the flow of the interpreter. So to illustrate that, uh, let's look at the scope diagram again. So for the inner scope, right, if I was a compiler and I was looking at the inner scope, because the other scopes are just fine, they are exactly the same, but now if I was looking at the inner scope, what would the compiler do? It would say var c, I create a new variable in inner, and now it ignores this, and it comes here, var b, now it creates a new variable called b in the scope of inner. Okay, so this happens before the execution, before the interpreter. Now when the interpreter comes here, that this is the scope chain, and now it executes this line. Now what happens here? It wants to look up C, and it says, hey, inner, do you have C? Inner gives a variable called C, right? It is in the inner scope. And now it says, hey, inner, do you have B? Guess what? The inner gives a variable called B, which is in the inner scope, right? So even though the var B is below, it really doesn't matter because what gets the variable B added to the scope is the compiler step, which had already happened before. It has already gone through one full pass at the code and it already knows that there is a variable B in the scope of inner. So when the interpreter executes this line and it wants to look up B, it already knows that there is a var B somewhere below in inner, right? It doesn't care where the order is. It just looks up the scope and says, hey, I've got a B. So it actually looks at the variable B in the inner scope. It does not go one level up, okay? And what's the value of B at this point of time? There is nothing that's assigned to B. So the value is going to be undefined. So now this gets the value of undefined and now console.log of C over here is going to print undefined. This is a little bit tricky because again, you have to remember that there are 
two passes in the code. And it's in you, during times like this that it actually helps to run through the code as a compiler once before you actually go to the execution, the interpretation step. And uh, this kind of behavior can be summarized in a more simple code. Okay, let me take all this thing out. And um, let's say I do something like this. Actually, I do something like this, all right? So this is the code. This is kind of simplifying what uh, we talked about and what behavior you would expect. I've told you that when you access a variable which is uh, not declared and uh, you do a read operation on it, the, the interpreter is going to give an error, right? Now, is this an access of a variable, a read access of a variable that's not declared? If you didn't know better, you would have said, yes, at this point of time, A isn't declared, so it's a read operation on an undeclared variable, it is going to give an error. But now that you know the compilation step and the interpretation step, your answer will be different. This is not an access of an undeclared variable because the variable is declared below. And it really doesn't matter what where it's declared because the compiler would have run through this first and created a variable A in the global scope. So when the interpreter actually executes this, there is already a variable A in the global scope. So this does not give an error. Now, what is the value of A here? It is undefined because the interpreter has not gone to line two, which actually assigns the value 10 to A. So when console.log of A prints, it prints undefined, but still it is an existing variable. So it does not result in an error. So this is putting the problem in the simplest code that I could put. And hopefully this kind of illustrates what happens here due to the two passes. And this behavior, it's what's called as hoisting. It's an important property of JavaScript variables. And we'll discuss more about that in the next video.